bringing together voices in child and youth healthcare. This is CAFC Presents. CAFC would like to thank the following member organizations for their generous support of our knowledge translation activities. The IWK Health Centre, the Children's Health Foundation of London, and the McMaster Children's Hospital Foundation. We would also like to thank the following Keystone partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of CAFC's programs and activities. Welcome to today's episode of CAFC Presents. My name is Doug Maynard and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centres. Today's webinar is titled Engaging Hard to Reach Families in Pediatric Rehabilitation. Get on to the presentation. Uh, today, you know, again, is going to be another great presentation that, g again, gives us a chance, uh, similar to last uh, week or two weeks ago, I guess it was, to discuss those non clinical issues that impact our ability to provide care to children and families. You know, similar to when we talked la two weeks ago about uh, how legal issues affect the, the ability of families to access care. Uh, or of providers to provide that care, this is a chance to get out of that clinical space and learn about and discuss those issues that challenge our ability to pro provide the best care to children and families. So it's always great to have an opportunity to, dis to discuss these unique issues that are, are very unique to the pediatric world and the child and youth care world. Um, and that presentation uh, that I was just mentioning, uh, when families go to court for care is what it's called. And it is it along with all of our other presentations, as always, the series on social pediatrics and everything else that we do here on CAFC Presents, we always do post on our Knowledge Exchange Network at www.ken.cafc.org. So uh, let's get on to introducing our panel. Uh, we have a couple of uh, extra folks on the line with us. We have, uh, since this uh, is a presentation and a topic that has uh, been uh, brought to us from our uh, the rehab network within CAFC, the Canadian Network of uh, Child and Youth Rehab. We have the co-chairs of the CINSER KT and Research Committee with us. We have Dr. Gail Andrew from the Glen Rose uh, Rehabilitation Hospital in Edmonton. And we also have with us Laurie Lessard, also in Edmonton, but not from Edmonton. She's just visiting Edmonton, but she's uh, from the John McGivney Center, uh, Children's Treatment Center in uh, Windsor, Ontario. So it's great to have Laurie and Gail on to provide help provide some expertise and commentary on this interesting topic. Our presenters, uh, first up, we'll have uh, Dr. Brenda Smith-Chant. Uh, Brenda is an associate professor and chair of the psychology department at Trent University. And she is also adjunct professor with the Milton and Ethel Harris Research Institute at York University and past coordinator of the developmental section of the Canadian Psychology Society. And her research interests are in the area of children's cognitive development and how early development is influenced by parents, educators, and social policy. And following Brenda, we have Michelle Phoenix. Uh, Michelle is a PhD candidate at the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University, studying engagement in pediatric rehabilitation services for hard to reach families. She's a member of uh, CanChild, the Center for Childhood Disability Research, and practices clinically as a speech language pathologist at KidsAbility, which is the Center for Child Development in Waterloo, Ontario. And she has a strong interest in evidence-based practice and has supported several clinical research projects and knowledge translation initiatives within the KidsAbility environment. So it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Brenda Smith-Chant. Over to you, Brenda. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I uh, am very thrilled to be on a webinar. As I was saying uh, just before we all joined in, it's quite a high-tech, exciting period to be uh, presenting in. Uh, today, um, my job is to sort of come at you from two levels. One is that uh, I am a research geek. Uh, I am uh, heavily, I have been very heavily involved in very large research projects looking at social policies and interventions targeting the very earliest stages of development and beyond, uh, including provincial parenting and family programs like Healthy Babies, Healthy Children, the OEYC's uh, Ontario Early Year Centers, and Best Start. And I'm also uh, very involved in academic research with Peel Public Health and uh, their early parenting um, programs with Nurturing the Next Generation. And that's sort of my research background, my research experience. But I have to say, when it comes to engagement, um, my important background has nothing to do with academics. Uh, what I would like to uh, talk about a little bit is when I started out, I was a young stay-at-home mother. This is long before I ever became an academic, long before university. 
during that time, I somehow found myself uh, classified as a therapeutic foster home. And my job was to model parent behaviors uh, to the parents of my foster kids and really just sort of walk through, uh, be a positive uh, support. Now, during this time, I was an incredibly strong advocate and supporter of the community intervention programs and support programs that are out there. I had a lot of very high needs foster kids, and um, I knew every social worker, every uh, therapeutic uh, personnel in my community that you can possibly imagine. And I was really pro uh, getting people involved. But then um, some, some things started to go wrong in my life. And what happened to me was I went from middle class to welfare, and it took three weeks because I was a young mom with no job. Uh, prospects, no credentials, and no opportunities. Uh, and this was quite an important period because at that time, um, I began to realize that at my greatest need, when I was a person who could really benefit from social programs, I was also one of the biggest hypocrites. Those very same organizations that I used before, that I supported for other people, I was now avoiding like the plague. As a social service commuter, a consumer, I was not engaged and I was not participating. I became one of those people who just wouldn't join in, even to well-designed programs that, I was supposed to, that were there to help me. Now you might say, well, that was quite a shock, Brenda. You're probably just embarrassed to go from needing, you know, uh, supporting people to needing help. And what I realized from talking with other people who were in my situation, that it was not just embarrassment that was causing my failure to find these programs useful. There were tangible reasons. I actually end up incredibly shocked at how we design intervention programs uh, for people we deem as needing of support. So my goal here today is to present another way at looking at uh, the issue of how we engage families. My goal is to maybe shake up some complacency. Uh, I want to ask why are these hard to reach families so difficult to engage? And I'd like to sort of cause you to question your assumptions, your expectancies, and maybe get you to be more critical, to pass that critical eye on your own activities and your own approaches. So I want you to think about your programs and the issues you have with engagement. And as you go through, I want you to listen to what I have to say and I want you to critique yourself. Don't take my word for it. Critique along the way. Now, there's a lot of research and as an academic, I always go to the research first and uh, I can tell you that there's a lot of research on how to engage families. And what it says is that uh, hard to reach families are diverse. And that may sound rather trite and silly, but um, that is the case. They are diverse. So people who are easy to reach in one program may be very hard to reach in another program. There's, there's not a, little, a lot of consistency. It's a lot of research that's been done, but not necessarily uh, identifying a lot of commonalities. The problem we have as researchers is, not surprisingly, um, you may have trouble getting hard to reach families to engage in your programs, but guess what? They don't participate in research either. They're hard to reach for us too. Um, when people don't engage, they tend to be hard, hard to talk to in multiple domains. So a lot of times we're, in, we're doing research on the families who are not that hard to reach, which doesn't really help the issue. And I think that's a major problem as researchers. We, we aren't um, asking the right questions uh, and using good techniques that will get at the issue. Now, when you do look at parent engagement, <laughs> issues that are almost universally identified for people not getting engaged, uh, most commonly uh, people will say, I don't have time or I lack access to childcare, or I have access issues. And right there, I want to sort of stop people. And this reminds me of something that happens with my neighbor. I have lovely neighbors. Um, they often invite us for dinner. 
Um, they're rather senior and uh, they're well-meaning. Um, but every time they invite us over for dinner, we're not so thrilled. So what I always tell them when I don't want to participate in their evening is I say, oh, wish I could go, but I don't have time. I'm too busy. And that's one of the things that we have to be very careful about as researchers because the reasons people give are not the real reasons they're not that they're engaging quite often. Quite often, uh, people will say things like, I don't have time. Meanwhile, uh, they go home and on average, they're watching 28.8 hours of TV viewing. That's according to Canadian staff. Uh, they're online. They're on Facebook. They are doing other things. Uh, what they're actually saying is, I don't have time for what you are offering. The other issue is that we know some of the other reasons that they give are not core and central. Because they will say things like, oh, I don't have childcare, I don't get there. But I can't tell you how many programs I have been working with who say, oh, well, we'll provide childcare, we'll provide transportation, but the solution does not result in better parent engagement. So it sort of leaves everybody uh, wondering, you know, when you deal with time, you try to make it more convenient. You run things earlier in the evening or later in the evening. You provide childcare, you provide food, you provide all kinds of supports, and what happens is it doesn't result in higher levels of parent engagement. The main reason, or reason you will hear, is no reason whatsoever. They just don't tell you. Uh, this happens even to us, the people we don't hear from. So we're sort of uh, blanked out. We're, we're sort of denied the opportunity. Um, and this is a little bit of a problem because what it means is that we provide solutions, we reorganize things to address issues that aren't real issues. So because the issue is not about time, access, or childcare, those kinds of solutions don't necessarily fix the issue. And so what we're seeing here is for some reason people are failing to connect. We're failing to identify parental needs and motivations. Now this is, if, if we're marketers um, working in, in uh, product placement, we would know this. We would beware of what parents say. And I will just point out a very famous example. Remember uh, new Coca-Cola. New Coca-Cola came out. Uh, it was a response to what people said they wanted. They wanted something more refreshing. They wanted uh, something that was uh, less sweet. And so Coca-Cola, after doing all of this research, listening to what people said, made major changes, and it turned into a nightmare. Everybody just reacted very badly. So what we know from marketing is that there are huge discrepancies between what people say they want and what they actually would participate in. And you don't even need to look very far. Look in your own life. I have to say, uh, I buy gym memberships. I have great intentions. I say I want to get fit and I want to be healthy. However, my gym membership is notable in that it holds a place in my wallet and never ever comes out after the first week. So we have a tendency as as consumers of services to say one thing but not necessarily follow through in action. And once again, I would say we need to think more like marketers and not like social service people. There's a lot of lessons that we know. And one of the first things anybody in marketing would say is that if you're having trouble getting people to use your service to buy your product, what you need to do first is marketing research. You need to know uh, who you're dealing with. Now one of the things that I've done, I, I've worked with quite a few uh, community service agencies and they, you know, they say, oh, we have terrible trouble. We, we put our programs at different times to deal with the time issue. We have babysitting services. We provide free transportation. We even give them food when they get here and free gifts from some of our donors to entice them to come out and they still don't come. Or they'll go once and then they never come again. So one of the things I always say to them is, all right, thinking of your target audience, thinking of your target group, what do these people do 
that they love to do? What brings them joy? What are they doing with their children already? Uh, what do they go out of their way for? What do they never, ever miss? Because, you know, if, if we think of it as barriers of time and access, well, what do they make time for? What do they find the, uh, the ability to get around uh, to do? Where are the last few places they actually went and want to go back again? And what are their goals for themselves and their children? Now, this is a very important point because in psychology, there's a very important phenomenon that says it's easier to make minor shifts in people's behavior than ask for wholehearted change. So if you know already what people are gravitating towards, what they make time for, what they do on their own, you can make use of that information to increase engagement. Now, I had a couple of uh, people I was working with, and when they saw this, um, I asked them, you know, they were, they were trying to deal with teen moms. And I said, well, where do these teen moms go for fun? What do they do for fun? And they had no idea. And I said, that's going to be a problem, because if you don't know what motivates people, then you're, you're not going to be able to market very well. When they just won't come, one of the other things I'm going to challenge you is to say, are you irrelevant? And I want you to just bear with me. In our well-meaningness, we tend to design programs that are a lot like school. They're often, when we target parents or families, they're designed on a workshop basis. And it's done that way because many of us who've been trained at a high level love our workshops. I mean, we'll go to webinars. As a matter of fact, that's why you're here. Uh, you love to be educated because that is something that you've, you've uh, successfully engaged in. However, many of our families do not enjoy the model of the workshop of the professional expert uh, giving knowledge. Um, it has negative connotations. A lot of people didn't make it through high school and didn't want to go to college or university. And even those who did, may not necessarily want to engage in it again. So often what we see with many of our well-meaning interventions is that we adopt models that are not necessarily those that are deemed to be uh, useful or relevant. And so what ends up happening is we design things more for us than we do for them. Uh, many times, I have to say, the professional is a pers person of knowledge that the treatment and program goals become paramount and there's no room for the parent and for the family because you have, and part of it is that we all have time limitations. You're trying to make maximum efficiency in use and to deal with parents and to deal with things outside of the program can be quite distracting and uh, not necessarily the focus. Uh, for many of us. Many of us are very driven by the goal of our treatment of, uh, program. What we're also in danger of is um, activities, our activities are perceived as not being relevant to our target group. Quite often when programs are presented, uh, they may be viewed as silly or ineffective, and that's possibly because of a lack of information, but it's more than that. There may be fundamental disagreements with the approach that is being provided. This is especially true with exceptionalities. And I know everyone who deals with individuals who has ex uh, with exceptionalities, there are online communities, uh, numbers and numbers and numbers of them, with vested interests and uh, on particular approaches to dealing with uh, issues, for example, autism, that may be uh, fundamentally in disagreement with the approach of your program. So here you are saying we have a program, this is what we're going to do, but people may not be on board for that. They may have different perspectives. And if they disagree with the approach or they have questions about the approach, this will make it very difficult for them to engage. This is the danger. When we fail to engage, we tend to blame 
the, uh, the client. Blame the person we're trying to engage. We tend to see this as their problem. Um, one of the most devastating things is the assumption that if they don't attend, they must not care. And what I hear a lot of people say is uh, the, job, the job they see in terms of engaging is to make people care more. Um, you hear it in some of the statements. You know, if they understood about what we were trying to do uh, and the methods, they would value this more. They would care more about what we do. And I want to say that this is dangerous because what tends to happen when you see this as their problem, uh, they need to increase their motivation to attend. What ends up happening is rather than change our approach, uh, we tend to get punitive. And I have heard of many programs where if people don't engage immediately, uh, it's sort of a you know, uh, zero tolerance. You don't engage, you don't attend, and that's it. You don't get access to service again. Um, you are on the no-go list, so to speak. So rather than understand why there may be a problem, why people may not uh, be engaging right off the bat, it is immediate. It, it's because they don't care. They're, they're people who are wasting our time. There are other people who who are more deserving, more motivated, and we should go to them. So this becomes a little bit of a problem when you're a service organization and you don't understand what was it that drove people to say no in the first place or not engage in the first place. So I want to just sort of have you think about that, mull it through, because if you're having trouble engaging parents, I want you to stop and ask yourself, why? So stop blaming, so just put aside all of the things you've heard about people saying, oh, I don't have time, oh, I can't get there, or it's a problem I don't understand, or you know, they just don't understand. I also want you to think about what are your judgments when people don't come? Do you see this as a failure of their motivation? Are you punitive in your activities or even in your subjective attitudes? And how much do you really understand about why they haven't? So think about that, and as we move forward, I'm going to just talk about what we do know from research. What we do know uh, about how to develop a program, and it's very exciting, and I'm thrilled that Michelle will be presenting after this with a program where she has done just that, reconsidered some of these questions to come at the issue of engagement from a very uh, unique perspective, something that addresses uh, needs that she has identified uh, for, her, for her audience. So the first step, you got to understand your audience. You have to think like a, a marketer, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that. Then your next job is to make a connection, and connections allow you to lead to relationships and relationships are built on trust and value. So this is sort of where we're going. We're not just engaging parents. We're finding, it's almost like developing a romantic relationship or any other friendship that we develop. We have to think about the steps that are natural for people when they engage. So in real research, one of the things that uh, we've been uh, doing now is uh, waiting for a period of time and then going back and talking to people who, were, who failed to engage. Um, oftentimes, time reduces the re reluctance to share real thoughts. You know, water has passed under the bridge, and you'll hear uh, the more reality. Uh, for example, at the university, we don't talk to students immediately when they quit university about why they quit university, because we know they always tell us the same thing. Um, I, I didn't have the money. Um, I had. Uh, I had to go. I, I didn't like the program. When you talk to people a few years uh, after they've dropped out, what we actually, when we go back, we actually hear other things. It's got nothing to do with money, and we know that because increasing bursaries doesn't drop stop dropout rates. What we hear is that other things, uh, homesickness, um, 
feelings of inadequacy, those were the factors. So oftentimes allowing some distance. The distance in time can is also needs to be mirrored by distance between service providers, those providing the service, and the parents who you're asking the critique from. Because if I gave a program, uh, this is really bad for Canadians. We're too nice. So what you hear is, oh, I love the program. Mary was lovely. We don't want to be negative about people. Um, so we don't, you know, we say everything's lovely. Oh, it was the time. Kind of like I do with my neighbors. I don't want to hurt their feelings and tell them, gee, you're really boring and we don't have a lot in common. So I say, oh, I just don't have time. What we need is to have some, some difference so that I'm not telling you why you're irrelevant uh, directly. Um, it's, it's not really something that's nice to do. As well, I'm going to invite everyone, and I keep saying this uh, to government people and to service provider, it's not an engagement failure. It is research, and now you know when something fails, you know what doesn't work. Time to move it on. There's a famous quote by Einstein. It's like, insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting a different result. When you have a negative result, it's a good time to say, all right, that didn't work. What can we do differently? So real research moves it forward. Stop doing things the same but louder with more pamphlets. The next thing, um, and Michelle will be talking more about these, these, uh, the importance of making a connection. We've been doing a lot of research, and unfortunately, in our well-meaningness, um, experts have a tendency to come across as judgmental unintentionally. This is not an intentional thing. Uh, because they are invested in an approach, oftentimes they come across as this is the right approach. So what we have to uh, keep in mind, to make a connection, the most important thing is to be open and friendly. To avoid that, oh, have, you know, this is the best program for your child kind of talk at the beginning, to sort of ask questions, to listen. The other thing we need to understand is that uh, there's a one-shot reality. Um, the first contact person is going to be the most important person for retention in your entire organization. We were doing a big program at SickKids uh, with families of children with spina bifida. And one of the things we did was we put the most non-judgmental, friendly, sweet nurse as our contact person. And this woman was just so lovely, everyone adored her, and she made sure our retention rate was in the high 90s. And when we asked people, what keeps you going year after year, because this was longitudinal work, and it was the, that one person. Um, so your first contact person is most important, but unfortunately, due to money and financial constraints, often it is a temporary person, a volunteer, or somebody who is the least paid and least skilled uh, in your organization. And that, that needs to change. This is actually the most important job. Creating relationships. And this is a problem specific to uh, intervent, a, a very, very key in, in interventions. Wait lists, even short ones, are huge problems. And I know we all know that. I know nobody loves to have a wait list. Nobody wants a wait list. We get them. The problem if you have a wait list is how do you maintain a relationship um, during the time that service isn't provided? And that is critical because there's nothing worse for a family than hearing that they need a program uh, and then they're sort of, uh, they're told they're on a wait list and a few pamphlets might be sent, but otherwise they've got nothing. And what we need to understand is that there are plenty of for-profit and other types of organizations who will fill the waiting gap. So parents tend to seek out similar others uh, and then they get invested in those organizations and those uh, programs um, and then when there's room and they can come off this, uh, the wait list, sometimes they've engaged somewhere else and they're not 
uh, open, to, you know, they're no longer open to the idea that they uh, would participate. They're, they want to, they are invested in another uh, focus. The other thing that I think uh, we underestimate is diagnosis shock. I know we all know that finding out that your child has been deemed by someone, uh, even yourself, as needing some intervention. Many times people just aren't ready. They're not sure. It's kind of like marital counseling. Oftentimes when our marriages are in trouble, uh, I always relate things to personal experience, we, we go into shock. Uh, we try everything else and then we wait for the intervention that is much more structured and, uh, you know, after we can't fix it. Uh, after we've tried, you know, all of the other types of things, um, you know, the romantic holiday or, or talking through our problems, you know, things uh, that we get from the self-help shelf before we move into, okay, we need to bring in a professional. And that, diagnos not, uh, that diagnostic shock at the beginning sometimes takes a while to resolve. So you're ready to give them intervention, but they may not be quite ready to accept the help. And if you have a punitive uh, wait list where you will say, if you turn us down once, you're off the wait list, uh, that, that could do a disservice to people who are in sh actually in shock. I'm going to start to finish up um, because I, I actually have uh, spoken on workshops uh, for a full day on these topics. And we could spend a lot of time talking about specific issues and different types of approaches to increase engagement. But one of the things I'd like to acknowledge, and, and this was the toughest one for me when I was a foster parent, because we have this idea that, we, you know, people need our help. They should take our help. If they understood that we were there to help, they would value us and they would participate and engage. And what I would like to point out is that, um, in North America, unfortunately, uh, there's this thing called free will. And we have to make peace with the idea that people can choose not to participate in a, in a program. We can, we can try our best to meet their needs, but at, at some point we have to make peace with the fact that we may fail to engage a number of people because we can't make them. There are some interventions where you can force people to participate. We call them school. Um, and sometimes there's court-ordered programs, but for the most part, we don't get to pick that. And, and that one's a toughie uh, because oftentimes we're very committed to believing that we have a very effective program, or at least a program that's better than some of the other options. The other thing that I sort of recommend is if you find that you're incentivizing to attend, to get attendance. That's fine, because what you do see is that even marketers use incentives. Uh, just in the mail last week, I received a freebie for Oil of Olay, one of their new products. And the idea is that they give me something for free, like a coupon or uh, a free trial, um, in order to encourage me to try something new and uh, to continue using it. However, if you can get people in by providing free food or free whatever, but the minute the freebie stop, what you're seeing, what we're actually seeing is that uh, they're, they're not there because they value your product or your service. They're there because you paid them to be. And if you're using a lot of incentives, I would say, you might want to be careful uh, unless you can really afford to keep up the, the freebies. Um, and there's a lot of intervention programs out there that have been coming up to this issue. They incentivize at the beginning and then find that they can't maintain it and engagement falls off when they do. In conclusion, i just like to say, remind people what I said. And it's like identify your target group. Um, know what inter interests them, what motivates them. Um, acknowledge the realities of your approach. Um, we all have limitations. Uh, who, how are you running things? Where are you having issues with engagement? And then 
consider your missteps as important, important pilots that are informing you about things that will work and not work. And if you have a request for more information, first of all, Michelle has a wonderful program that she's going to be talking about next. And if you would like to ask me uh, for more information on my full workshop or talk on this issue, just give me a shout at breastsmith at trentu.ca. Thank you for the opportunity. I really look forward to your questions. Brenda, that was a great presentation. I mean, clearly from uh, your, your personal experiences, so well informed uh, your work following that. I mean, that's really, really quite incredible and, and, and really, really a great presentation. Uh, we did have one, uh, one uh, question come in. Um, the person's asking about uh, that first contact when you were describing that person who was so meek and lovely and everybody loved her and that really increased your, your engagement. As the first yeah. person in the organization contacting the family, is it, is it someone from the organization? Is it the receptionist greeting the client? Like, what's... Both. So uh, it, often, it depends on how your program is run. Um, whoever is the first person to introduce the program and to uh, talk to them about coming in to attend a session, whoever's doing that work. In some cases, it is actually the clinician making an, an, an appointment. And uh, clinicians, uh, what we often see is they have limited time. They're doing this in between sessions, and sometimes they get a little abrupt. Same thing happens with a receptionist. Uh, uh, with us, we had a very, uh, the nurse made all of the appointments because there were multiple, uh, for the study, multiple appointments that would have to be made and travel arrangements because they had to come to Toronto for um, the uh, study. And so we had a special person who sort of coordinated. And many jurisdictions, particularly in Canada, I know when there's an issue, they'll have a coordinator who's providing multi, uh, sort of uh, providing um, appointments for a series of people. Whoever's doing that first contact needs to have a, a patience, open, friendly, chatty uh, to to give a sense of of we're here for you. All right, so uh, that was the only question for now, but again, my, my opportunity to remind the audience, type your questions in as you think of them. If you do think of questions for Brenda as we're, as we're moving into the next portion of the presentation, we will be getting to those uh, following Michelle. Uh, so please do type your questions in uh, as you think of them throughout the rest of this presentation. So, uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, hand the uh, virtual podium now over to Michelle Phoenix. Over to you. Well, thank you. I think the pr work that I'll present is a nice complement to what we've just heard at sort of a, an overall level, and I can bring you right back down to a more specific level to present a case example of how we developed and implemented a care path to promote engagement with hard-to-reach families within a pediatric rehabilitation facility. But before I get into the meat of it, I'll just introduce myself. Personally, I live in Guelph, Ontario with my husband. We have two daughters and a third baby expected in September. So family is very much what I'm thinking about, what I'm doing every day, and what motivates me. Professionally, I work as a speech-language pathologist at Kids Ability Centre for Child Development. And I'll give you some information about Kids Ability because that's where all of this work was developed and carried out. So Kidsability is a children's treatment center or a community-based pediatric rehabilitation facility within the Waterloo region. And we provide a range of services, including occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech language pathology, social work services, recreational therapy, and medical services. Primarily, the children that are seen at the center are zero to five years old, with some services continuing until 18 years old. Families can refer themselves for service, and there's no diagnosis needed to receive service at Kids Ability, and there's no fee for service. Typically, the services are provided in center, either with group or individual therapy models, but we do have some community-based programs as well. And there's five sites of service within Kids Ability, and that serve approximately 5,000 children per year. And academically, I'm a PhD candidate within the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University, and I'm a part of CanChild's Center for Childhood Disability Research. So I do want to make sure that there's time for questions today, but what I will try to get through is just some background information about how this work came about. I'll describe for you in detail what the care path is, 
how we implemented it, how we expanded that program, the lessons that we've learned, and then there will be approximately 25 minutes for questions either for myself or for Brenda. So the problem from my own perspective came to my attention right as I graduated um, six and a half years ago when I began work at Kidsability. I was providing mainly in-center individual therapy and I had about 20 spaces to offer and so I decided to take the first 20 kids off the wait list. In a naive moment I thought that would do the trick. I'd give them a call and get them in. Little did I realize, and I learned very quickly, that it doesn't work out so smoothly. I was calling families and not getting a response. I was sometimes able to book families in for therapy that they might attend or they might not attend. And then I was trying to follow up with families, and sometimes I could successfully do that, and sometimes I wouldn't. And some of these families were being discharged without ever having been seen for therapy. And so I was really quite frustrated and this was time consuming and I knew we had lengthy wait list for service so I spoke to my mentor and I just said, what am I doing wrong here? Am I not selling this enough? Am I not kind enough? Am I not tough enough? Like, what am I doing? And she said, no, this really isn't just you. This is a problem for all clinicians within our program. And so I started to look around and she was right. Even um, very experienced clinicians with established caseloads were still having clients missing their appointments or sometimes having to discharge for a series of missed appointments. And so I looked within our center at our center-based statistics and we found within a one-year period there were over 4,000 missed appointments and 33% of those or 1,367 were missed without prior notification. And if you do some quick math and you allocate half an hour for planning, for setting up, for taking down, for documenting, for trying to reschedule with a family, for every one of those appointments, it amounts to between a 0.5 and a full-time equivalent position used within a year on appointments that didn't happen. And so that was ineffective for our organization. And we wanted to know better what to do. So we talked to our community partners and we asked, how are we as an organization servicing the families that typically access your service? And they said, for some families, you do a really great job, but there's families that you're missing and you need to remember that one shoe doesn't fit all. That's the quote that stuck with me. And so I thought, well, they're right, but we don't know what to do differently. And so I asked for some clinical time to look into the literature to see what best practices existed. And as has been mentioned, um, these families are typically called hard to reach families and they're defined as families who are eligible for a service but for a variety of reasons, they don't use the service that's offered. And Brenda's already talked about some of the, the reasons. They're, they're diverse and they're complex. They might be referred to the individual, to the service provider, to the neighborhood, to the family. And when you have such complex reasons for, for disengagement or for not engaging, you need equally complex solutions to promote engagement. And those require time to implement. And some of the challenges that I came across when I was reviewing this literature was, was, as has been mentioned, most of the research isn't being done with the hard to reach families themselves because they're difficult to engage in research. And so the best practices were generally representing the views of the service providers or of families who engage in services. And that led me to pursue a PhD because I really wanted to hear the perspective of the hard to reach families themselves. The other challenge with the literature is that it typically wasn't drawn from pediatric rehabilitation. It was coming from early intervention, public health, social service, and I, I couldn't say how transferable the results were. And so again, my thesis work will, will look at a pediatric rehabilitation context. But still, I was entering as a part-time student. I had a six-year program planned and we couldn't wait six years for the results, so I used the available literature and I was also taking a knowledge translation course at the time. And I realized, well, there, we do have some evidence. There's, there's flaws with it potentially, but we need to fix something to improve care for these families. And I came to realize how difficult it is to move from evidence into practice. And so I used knowledge translation theory, specifically the knowledge to action cycle. I won't spend a lot of time talking about this today just to help you realize that it is a lot of work to change clinical practice, even if you have strong evidence to support those changes. 
And so I began in the center triangle with knowledge creation. And I was reviewing the literature. I looked at a previously completed knowledge synthesis. There's a systematic review to define and engage hard-to-reach families um, done by Boeg Monroe in Evangelou out of the Department of Education at Oxford. And I, I compiled all of that evidence into a knowledge tool at the base of that triangle. And that's the care path that I'm going to describe for you. It's called MATCH, Making Alternative Therapy Choices Happen. But that wasn't the end of the story. We had a care path, but we really needed to work through implementation. And so I used the knowledge to action cycle, the series of arrows going around the perimeter, to guide us through a set of set steps to promote implementation for both the pilot and the expanded program. So this is what the care path looks like. Um, it starts with the kid's ability clinician identifying a need for service. And those of you who are really paying attention will notice that there's an issue with that. We have to um, have known the child and family in some way, shape, or form in order to identify a need for service and make sure they're eligible for service. And so there's some families we know that never come through our doors that are never known to us, and, and they are hard to reach families, and this doesn't address that issue. What this is really meant to address is families who are known to us, a need is identified, therapy is recommended, but we think they might have difficulty accessing or engaging with that therapy. So the next stage, and it's underlined there, is the family and clinician identify the barriers to participation. So it's underlined because I'm going to just describe some of the barriers that are identified through the literature. And those include the parents of children with disabilities having high parental stress, anxiety, or depression. Um, families who are hard to engage might be families who live in poverty, young parents, or single parents. They might have difficulties with transportation, lack of childcare for siblings, or language barriers. The family might not yet re be ready for a change. They might be adjusting to a child's delay or a diagnosis. And there can be a lack of trust between the family and the service provider. And that's not necessarily because of the individual providing service, but potential for previous negative interactions with the education system, uh, social systems. Um, they might be involved with family and children's services. So I'm going to pause and catch my breath, but I would like to ask a question. And just thinking about your own organization and the services that you provide, I'd like you to check all of the barriers or the potential barriers that would apply for your clients. And it's going to be broken into two different polls, and I'll walk you through the answers. So everyone should see the question up on their screen, and we can see some answers coming in. Um, so as Michelle said, you know, this is applying to your the families that you're dealing with, and what do you see as as uh, as affecting them, the the hard to reach families that you're dealing with? And this is a select all that apply. You don't have to limit it to just one. And we are doing this in two parts, so there will be a, a second one, just because we had lots of uh, answer choices, and we we can only put so many on a on a screen. So we'll give everyone another. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to walk people through the answers, but I sure. think they can see them all on their screen. Yeah, so it looks like most of the responses are in. We've got uh, most of the audience has provided a response. So we can close that off, and let's look at what they see so far, or what they've said so far. Wonderful. So we can see that the most common are is uh, living in poverty at 94% and close behind is the transportation barriers and scheduling conflict at 92% of the audience saying that, and then language and cultural barriers coming from 84% of the audience. Wow, so they're all quite high. And it's it's a little bit way what I expected to see. And we will follow up with the second part of that poll as well. Um, because often, families either don't have just one reason for being hard to reach. I suspect that lots of families are faced by multiple barriers. The other thing is, organizations don't just try to provide service to one hard to reach family um, or kind of family that that's a diverse set of families and so I'd like you to to take this away with you as well as thinking about some of the other factors that Brenda mentioned and thinking about strategies to promote engagement need to be just as complex as the families that you're trying to promote engagement with and so if you could take a look at the last two um, responses there. 
And as you can see, we do have an other option. So if you have selected, and a few, a few of you are selecting that other, if you don't mind, if you, if you can, t type in what you mean by other uh, in the question box. Just type a little suggestion of what you might mean, and we'll see what, what people are thinking, uh, any, any barriers that, uh, that we may have missed that we might be able to identify. Yeah, so any of you who, uh, who selected other, if you can just type something into the question box to let us know what it is that you're thinking about. And so it looks like most of the answers are, are in, and a few people are typing in some responses. So, so we can show, we can see what everyone said on these ones. So, uh, so following from what the other one said, a little bit lower scores. So 87% saying low motivation or not yet ready to discuss the child's delay, et cetera. 79% saying mental health barriers. And 38% said the other. And some of the other that they're talking about are someone suggesting medically fragile. So they have many other medical priorities, waiting for other factors to be resolved, uh, family emergencies, services already provided at school addictions, someone said, cultural differences, which I think we sort of saw in one of the suggestions was about cultural differences, uh, physical health barriers, stigma or shame associated with, uh, with uh, acquiring services, um, child care for siblings, they don't have child care for the siblings. Um, not certain that any uh, that they have anything to contribute in a meaningful way, I'm, I'm assuming this, the, the mm. services, uh, not having anything to contribute, et cetera, mm. low literacy, the, the, the responses are still coming in, but I think that gives you a flavor of what people are thinking of. That's wonderful. And I did want to include that other category precisely for the reason that you're seeing. There's so many different reasons. There, there's no way I could have um, put them all within this poll, but I really encourage you to consider the diversity in the families that you're trying to see. And right up front, don't wait for them to stop attending service or to disengage altogether um, to really think about the complexity of the child and the family situation and, and what might present as a barrier so that you can start working through those things early on in your caregiving process. So if a family and clinician have identified a barrier to participation, and at Kids Ability, our families are di as diverse as the ones who are being described by this group, so I didn't limit the barriers that were acceptable or non-acceptable. We really left it wide open um, to see what would happen. And we've continued to keep it that wide open post the pilot because of the diversity in the families that we are seeing. And if you identify a barrier, you would then go on to discuss the match principles with the family. And again, I've, I've underlined it. And these are the principles that I felt were coming through from the literature as promoting the engagement of hard to reach families. Number one is to begin where the family is comfortable. The second is the primary service provider should have the closest relationship with the client. And a lot of this echoes the information presented by Brenda earlier with respect to requiring minimal changes from the perspective of the family, starting with the things they're already doing, they're already motivated to do, and really focus on the connection and the relationship building when we're trying to engage these families. The third is take time to build trust. Follow the family's lead and be persistent. Partner with other involved agencies. Avoid written communication, and that's just because of the potential for undisclosed low literacy levels or language barriers and initially avoid groups. And I know a lot of people are taken aback by that, but um, it's just because of the potential for feeling judged or high anxiety amongst the hard to reach families or um, avoiding that sort of school-like feel that people may have not enjoyed or been successful with early on. And then again, recognize that motivation fluctuates over time. And just the asterisk at the bottom, if you really think that motivation is the primary issue for preventing engagement in services, there is a body of literature around motivational interviewing that I can't get into now, and I wouldn't be the best person to speak to you about that either, but it does have a solid evidence base and some really hands-on clinical ways to addressing motivation with clients who are deemed resistant to change. So if you've had a chance to discuss those principles with the family and they agree with a different or an alternate model of service provision that would incorporate those ideas, you would move on to make a match therapy plan. You would begin by identifying goals. Primarily, your first goal is just to build a trusting relationship with the family. And second is to choose a family priority goal. 
And and that's to get at some of what Brenda was saying around often we come in with these preset therapy goals. We're going to work on this, this, this within this program that might not align with the family's most meaningful and significant work. And so we would start instead with something hopefully small that a family really wants to address. And then you would choose a primary service provider. And again, that's the person who has the most well-established relationship with the family or who can best address the family's priority goal. So even for children who are involved with multiple clinicians who have, who have multiple needs, the other clinicians might stay involved with that child and family, but indirectly. And so they would provide information through consult to the primary service provider. He would then implement match by developing an action plan, offering therapy and immediate feedback, and consider transfer to a traditional model of care by six months. And that, that last point is not an evidence-based suggestion. There's nothing magical that happens at six months. That was really a pragmatic decision that we made within the organization because we didn't know how many families would be using this program, how resource intensive it could be or would be, and what sort of outcomes we could even hope for using it. And so we just wanted a point of monitoring to see whether or not the families could move to a more traditional model of care or whether they continued to need this program or, or whether or not they might be ready for discharge. So how did it go? We obtained community-based funding through a, an organization for a one-year pilot. And I was hired in a half day a week to sort of run the program and evaluate it during that year. So I began with clinician training. And we offered the training to all of the clinicians at the pilot site, which included occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech language pathologists, our social workers, and our recreation therapist. And any of them could offer the match care path, but none of them were mandated to. Alongside the training, as part of using the knowledge to action cycle, I did a questionnaire to look at assessing the barriers to, to implementation within our site and also to tailor the care path to our own unique needs. And what I asked clinicians was, who are the hard to reach families that you have seen? Not, not for identifying information, but what are the factors that made them hard to reach? And what did you do to promote engagement with these families? And we found we had a large number of reasons that families would be considered hard to reach and that there was great variability in clinician practices. And so we used that information to tailor the care path. And then anybody was able to use it. So I monitored the program during the course of a year. And I monitored it by having any clinician who offered it send me just an email with who they were using it with, why they were using it, how they were using it, and the outcome. Was it discharged? Did they transfer to in-center therapy service? Or um, did they continue to use MATCH? And then we evaluated the outcomes a little more closely for two clients. And their clinicians who had offered MATCH wrote case reports around the reasons that they had used MATCH, how it went for the child and for the family from the clinician's perspective, and what were the outcomes. And they were pretty positive outcomes during that pilot year. MATCH was highly valued by the clinicians who used it. We were able to keep children in service for longer and potentially transfer to the other programs that the children needed down the road. The challenges were who to use the program with. And for some clinicians, the lack of rules. Clinicians who like to practice a more of a manualized way had difficulty with the flexibility and with the general principles that were required of this program. Just the same, the organization agreed to continue offering MATCH post the pilot year, and Kids Ability now funds this program as well. And to promote the expanded implementation, we used a knowledge brokering approach, whereby a clinician from the site of service who volunteered to take on a leadership role within the program would meet with myself and with the program manager in charge of the program to receive some extra training about MATCH and the evidence and the pilot, and then be prepared to do training for the clinicians at their own site of service. So we had four knowledge brokers do that at four sites of service. And after that, I did a clinician questionnaire electronically to look at how well they understood the program, how likely they were to use it. 42 people completed the questionnaire, and what we found was overall they understood the match care path quite well after training. 
how, and 87% of clinicians felt they would have an opportunity to use, to use it within six months. However, only 68% felt that they would be ready to use it. And so we asked about additional training needs and desires. Most people wanted to know more specifically how other people had used Match. And then they also wanted to receive that information by direct conversation with people who had used it. For the expanded program year, the knowledge brokers monitored the program use at their own site of service the same way I did during the pilot year. And we have final evaluation planned for August of 2014. Our overall successes have been an increased understanding of who the hard to reach families are within our community. It's promoted respectful language and thinking. It's improved communication with families and the provision of family-centered care. It's offered clinicians more flexibility in terms of the services that we can offer, and it's promoted accountability to the families. It's generated early outcomes that we've been able to share with others. The challenges um, have been overcoming some clinician reluctance because some people feel they already practice in this manner. Some clinicians feel this is too hard to add into an already busy practice and some people might be uncomfortable with the transdisciplinary model of practice. It's been difficult to provide enough training to clinicians to both under, help them understand that and to remind them that it's an option for their clients. And recognizing the need for match and offering match before clients stop coming in has been a major barrier. Often we recognize families are hard to reach when they have started to miss appointments, and then it can be hard to contact them to, to discuss alternatives. And finally, committing to evaluation has been difficult. And for me, my role as a clinician versus my role as an academic and as a researcher, it's been a challenge to figure out what's the best level of evaluation to do within a program like this. And just some general recommendations that you might want to take away is to think holistically about the needs of the child and the family and to consider the best practice recommendations, but also how they could fit within your environment. If you are planning to make organizational change, I would suggest using a knowledge translation framework and to build an evaluation and to share your experiences. And like Brenda, I'm happy to discuss this further, so I've left my contact information up there, and I will be engaged in this area of research for the next couple of years, so feel free to contact me. I would be happy to hear from you. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Another great presentation that really brought a lot of the practical aspects of, uh, of what Brenda initiated uh, this presentation with, so that was really excellent. Um, so we do have quite a few uh, 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 questions that have come in. Um, there were a couple of other suggestions in the, in the answer to the other uh, section of your survey. Um, a couple of people had some other interesting ones I just wanted to bring. One person suggested that uh, uh, they might be hard to reach families that are affected by the therapist or the agencies not knowing their mandate to serve kids. And she's talking specifically about uh, children, First Nations children on reserve and that sort of thing. And you know, we talk about the whole you know, lots of issues around Jordan's principle and agencies not sure what whose ro role is what in providing or funding services, et cetera. So I'm not sure if there's if you've dealt with that at all as part of your research or? I think that's the question I've been asked most as I've been presenting this more frequently lately is about, especially in Canada, Aboriginal families. And certainly they're recognized clinically as a hard to reach group. Within the research, I've yet to come across anything looking specifically at Aboriginal families and access or engagement in pediatric rehab services, but some of the research coming out of Australia has looked at access in, I believe it's healthcare services or social services for young children who are Indigenous populations, I think is the language that they use. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I do First Nations research as well. Um, we have, uh, with the um, Healthy Communities Initiative, we uh, looked at engagement um, using an activator model. And uh, the issues with First Nations are in spades. The models that often we provide are inconsistent with their perspectives on, on how they would like to engage. Um, there's also a mistrust of a lot of uh, organizational, it, it organized, uh, structured organizations and 
rightly so. Um, they have challenges with access and uh, you know distance, finances, all of the hard to reach issues um, in spades. The activator model was one that we tried in which um, uh, to increase engagement in, in healthy pro health related programs, they they would hire somebody from the community. Uh, uh, the community would pick them, and their job was just to develop programming, uh, you know, that engage people. And they were free to sort of come up with ways. If you're interested in that, you can get the uh, results. It's called CARA, C A R A, CARA uh, evaluation. It's online as a government. Pro uh, uh, sponsored research, but you can also email me and I can send it to you. It's a different model, but this is a challenge area uh, and it's not frequently uh, studied. The other thing I can add is I was just speaking at the Speech Language Audiology Canada Conference um, to a speech language pathologist who works in British Columbia and she was talking about uh, the principles of press practice and how they might apply within her the work she does with Aboriginal families. And she said that trusting relationship is the most key and beginning with people that the families are already comfortable with is the other important part. So she said in in areas, she serviced a couple of different areas and in the ones where the families had a good relationship with their, their connector person, the in-between person that she worked with, they would remain engaged in service. But for the communities where they didn't have as strong a relationship with that connector person, the families would disengage from her service. So I think there is some application that can be done, but it's more out of anecdotal and people's experience right now than a solid evidence base when it comes to rehab. All right. And Lori, uh, you, Lori uh, uh, Lassard from our uh, KT and Research Committee uh, had a question for you who's on our panel here. Go, go ahead, Lori, and, and ask your question. Michelle, thinking about, I guess it's the logistics of you already have a team of people or perhaps only one individual working with a family and you start to notice that they're disengaging. The model you're suggesting is that a person begins that conversation and offers a match model based on that conversation that decides who the key provider is going to be. I'm a little confused about how those logistics work. I, it, it makes sense at the beginning of a relationship with your organization, yeah. um, but not necessarily, you know, sort of along the path. So I'm wondering about the logistics and also if you sort of have your mind wrapped around what the competencies would be of similar to what Brenda was talking about, that very first person who might enter into these kinds of conversations about a match approach. Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways that families can be identified as a match family. If they come in for, let's say, a team assessment, I think that's the one that's more simple for people to understand, except that they probably don't have a a well-developed relationship with any of the service providers. They're very likely all new if the family is just coming in for an initial assessment with a team of individuals. And that's when you would choose the person who's most closely linked to their primary area of concern. But if a family is partway through their therapy intervention, at which point you notice they start to disengage, it might happen if they're moving from occupational therapist where they've been coming in weekly and then they go to start their speech therapy where they come in weekly and we can't get them in at all, we might go back to having the occupational therapist remain the primary contact and that the speech therapist could consult indirectly with the occupational therapist if there was speech-related concerns. Um, but what we find is once a family has an established relationship with a single service provider, so if it's that occupational therapist, then they're more likely to engage with the rest of the service providers from that organization. Does that answer your question? Um, yes and no. I think in our center we're c taking that as sort of the lead clinician model of deciding who's the right person at the right time to do the right things. Right. Um, I, I just, I don't know that early on you necessarily know who that's going to be. And you might have a team at that first visit 
um, none of whom seem to be bonding well with the family for whatever reason. Right. Um, and and I, I know that uh, one of the centers in Ontario is talking about a competency list or some training for those people that are going to take on that lead clinician role. Sure. And I think it's more than just being a knowledge broker or a champion. I'm not sure if it's covered in that extra training you're talking about. I'm, I'm just thinking about, you know, taking um, up clinicians who've been doing traditional work and, and expanding their skill set to be able to do a really good job as sort of the mini social worker trying to support families in a lead role. Yeah, I think that additional training would be wonderful and we haven't been able to offer that to any of the clinicians and I think that's listed as one of the challenges is how to engage in this transdisciplinary model of practice because people have felt that they are potentially out of their scope of practice, especially when the primary goal is to build a trusting relationship. So when it's not a, a specific clinically driven goal, but I would argue is just as important for the child and family to be able to, to work towards those really specific clinical goals, then it has been a, a challenge for clinicians to be able to, to do it and to have the skills and awareness to be able to do that. All right. So let's move on to some of the other questions that have come in from the audience. Um, uh, this one's for Brenda. Uh, Brenda, in the beginning of your talk, you spoke about how workshops may not be the best interactive format for engaging parents. Uh, uh, Hillary is, uh, is asking, what do you then suggest when needing an interactive event to engage or reach out to parents and seek out parental concerns or suggestions for, uh, for or in research? Do you have any suggestions as to what would work better than, uh, than that kind of workshop environment? I can tell you what we saw with um, uh, our, uh, we did a parenting experience uh, study where we asked what new parents, uh, parents transitioning into parenthood, I know it's not an equivalent group, but I suspect that uh, comparable information uh, or, or results would happen if you talk to this group. Workshops are often driven by curriculum. So you, know, you come up with your workshop and you're very, People tend to be very goal-driven, you know, there's a, you know, a set criteria of information. What we're hearing from a lot of parents is that what they'd rather have is much more of a, uh, a talk session, bringing their issues in and using adult education principles. And if you look at adult education principles, uh, what often happens is instead of the uh, teacher or the, the professional developing the workshop goals, the parents do. So what we see parents uh, often want to talk about what they want to talk about when they want to talk about it. And if they have the flexibility uh, to drive the topics of the work, of, of a gathering, that's one thing. The other thing that we're hearing from parents um, in, in many domains is that they value talking to others who are in situ, other parents, and having that sort of uh, sounding board. So not being, at about, not being so driven by sort of the workshop format where you have a person who is providing and guiding the conversation, but allowing um, people to have input. It's a little, you know, so, so I guess a focus group or a, uh, uh, a almost a drop-in model where people bring their issues. That model seems to be much more effective, at least when it comes to engaging. <laughs> All right. We had uh, a, another couple of questions that were similar uh, for you again, Brenda, and, and some of them were answered a little bit by, by the poll that Michelle asked and, and later on in the presentation, but it was really around you, you Brenda, you, you, at the beginning of yours, you talked about some of the myths of why people don't engage, and, and, yeah. and they suggested at the beginning you didn't really get into the details about what, as opposed to the myths, what, what are the real reasons? And then you got talking about the market being a being a market researcher to really understand your yep. demographics a little better. Um, so they're, they're asking from the marketing research perspective, could you describe the demographics of this target audience and and who, who exactly are these hard to reach people for whom you were suggesting the strategies? Yeah. Okay. If you had asked me this five years ago, I would have given you a different answer. 
traditionally hard to reach families were poor, uh, low income, low education, um, people who received, were recipients of social services. Uh, you know, the prototypical, I'm from a different culture, I have language barriers, those sorts of uh, people were our hard to reach group. About four or five, uh, three or four years ago, what we started to see uh, across the field is reports that this demographic of who's hard to reach shifting. And what we're hearing a lot more now, and I can report that I've been contacted by multiple jurisdictions, that families that we traditionally view as easy to engage are becoming harder to engage. And that is your, uh, your families who are associated with higher income, more professionally oriented, uh, um, uh, more educated. So there, there is a shift uh, that is occurring right now. So um, of what we're hearing is that programs that had no problem uh, at, at, you know, engaging people, or at least certain types of people, are now experiencing problems. So the issue we have here is that in any given program, a hard-to-reach family is one that just doesn't show up, and they're so diverse. There's, you know, you need to do research on. Who is it for your organization? It's uh, my cross Canada talk was called uh, "Avoiding the One Size Fits All Pantyhose Effect." That there's one answer to this, and and to hear Michelle say the "We're not all the same shoe size" is is very it resonates with me. Is that it's not an easy answer, and it's getting harder. Hello. Sorry, I was, my microphone was on mute. I often have to remind the speakers to uh, unmute themselves, and occasionally I fall into the trap myself. Um, uh, Laurie, and, and we have a little private chat uh, message between the panelists that we can see, and, and Laurie was asking a question uh, of, of whether Brenda or Michelle have any experience with online engagement. Uh, and Michelle, <laughs> you said that you, you don't, but I mean, in the world of, in this online connected world, what, what's the place of online engagement for these hard to reach families? Or has that improved uh, the, 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 the situation at all? Um, it's a double edged sword. Uh, people are much more active online than they were in the past. The problem is it's a very noisy field. And I'll just use, um, very common in Canada uh, experience, and uh, that's families with children who've uh, been identified as uh, autism spectrum disorder. Online, um, there are so many resources, talk lines, drop-in centers, programs, online resources that are available to families that um, standing out from the crowd is very difficult. We do know from research, not on um, pediatric rehabilitation, but more generally, that uh, another double-edged sword of online is that people will look like they're engaged, but not engaged. And uh, I will just, uh, one of the most uh, important research studies I think ever done was somebody had uh, uh, took an online help group and just said, let's meet face to face. So he made an appointment. And he had something like 900 people who were part of this. He had 600 people say, yes, I will come to this event. And in the end, only three people showed up. So what we see online is that people are more likely to look like they've engaged by saying, oh, we will come, but not actually show up. So uh, that's another thing, that they look engaged, but they're only engaged very superficially. All right. The next question is for uh, Michelle, and, and Wendy is asking, how has the MATCH program affected your wait list for services if your clinicians are having to travel to homes more, more than before? Yeah, that's a great question, and it was one of the primary concerns when we started running match is would we have the resources to support it and what would it do to, would we potentially be penalizing the other children or families who are waiting and would come in for service by, by making them wait longer? Um, 
It hasn't, I don't think, affected our wait list for service. There's been so many other organizational changes at the same time that it's very difficult to piece together what would be due to match and what would be due to other organizational changes. However, during the pilot, we only had 10 children and families who used match, and all of them requested less intensive service than they would have had had they come in for what would generally have been offered or provided for a child presenting the way that the, the children were presenting. Um, very often, the children were being requested, or the families were requesting that we see them in their child care center, but instead of weekly appointments, they would be seen once per month. And so it was no more resource heavy necessarily than what they would have been offered anyway. It is more resource heavy obviously than if they had been discharged, in which case they're probably not using resource anymore, but neither are we meeting their needs. And so it's a balancing act between trying to meet the needs of the children and families we have already accepted into service while um, being mindful that there are children and families waiting for service as well. And sort of another question for you, Michelle, uh, from uh, from Susan. Uh, she's asking, does the MATCH program focus mainly on families who are at risk of not attending the assessments or the therapy appointments, or also on families who may attend but then have difficulty following up on the therapist's recommendations and suggestions? For sure. Right now, we've only focused it on families who might not attend because we definitely know that there are families who come in but don't necessarily engage. They're not changing their behaviors, etc. And that's a very, very difficult thing to monitor or to assess. And I just had another recent conversation about families who come in but aren't necessarily engaged. For the purpose of MATCH, to keep it clear and simple, it's been using service use, so whether or not they're coming in, as our indicator of engagement. And I realize it's a much more complex issue than that with families who might attend but not necessarily engage. I'm not sure whether or not MATCH would be the best way of addressing that need. Also, I'm not sure what's the best way to, to determine if families are engaged. I've yet to see a measure of engagement that would be sensitive enough to look at the complexity of that nature. All right, the next question uh, is from France, and she, uh, this is, I think we'll start with this one with Brenda. Um, she's asking, again, back to this first point of contact uh, person, this primary contact person. She's asking, do you have any suggestions on how to choose that primary contact person when a child is involved in specialty services such as augmentative communication or seating and mobility issues? Uh, you want, um, okay, so, so the education, I believe, is not as important as the personality. Um, you need somebody who is warm and comes across as very warm. Uh, they need to have the perspective that they are there to be of service as opposed to organizing the service. So they, they uh, and I'll just give you an example uh, of one of the things uh, when our our lovely woman, who is quite warm and thoughtful, very good listener, um, and what she heard from our families who were coming into Toronto is that they were a little bit hesitant, and she identified that by switching the hotel that we booked them into to one that had this is going to sound kind of silly, it cost ten dollars more per per visit uh, per day, but it had a water slide. You might know it if you're if you ever go to Toronto. It's very popular. It's not far from sick kids. So equal distance um, from our previous hotel, a little bit, you know, $10 more expensive. And what happened was uh, the families had something to do in the evening and with, their, uh, with the siblings. And for us, we had the luxury of having a person who was the arranger who was picked for that. But it's really about the warmth and the listening and the consideration. So these are, these are personality traits. Uh, that you know could be that could be present even in a person who is not specifically trained in um, rehabilitative services or any services. So we're talking about qualitative uh, aspects. Um, 
So we have a few more questions come in. We, we've got about four minutes left, so I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them. Um, so, but we'll try. Uh, this next one is for Michelle, and, uh, and uh, Mary Ellen is asking if you can provide a case example, a short one, uh, regarding a child and family who went through the match process, and just sort of describe what that looked like for us. So during the pilot, two clinicians wrote about their experience using MATCH in a little bit more detail so that we could understand how it was really working and, and share that information with our managers and with our funders with the client's permission. And one of the cases shared described a young child who was being taken care of by his grandmother because his mother um, was dealing with drug addiction. The grandmother came in for assessment and was sort of at her wit's end. She was working very long hours that she had to do to be able to provide um, financially for herself and for, I think, her daughter. Don't quote me on that. And definitely for this young boy. And she was trying to keep him in daycare to allow for herself to work, but he kept getting kicked out of daycares because of his behavior and his needs. And she was uh, in tears, um, just absolutely stressed out by her situation. She didn't know what to do differently, and she was just kind of staring at who happened to be a speech-language pathologist, but could have been anybody with this help-me look. And the speech pathologist at that time realized all the things we typically would have offered, groups, individual um, therapy sessions, etc., weren't going to work for this family. She was doing as much as she possibly could. And so she said, how would I support you in finding a daycare that can meet the needs of your, your child? And so she did that. We went through other community agencies that can support children in daycare, found him a supportive placement. And then when he came up for therapy, there's still a therapy wait list, the, ch the services were provided in consult to the daycare to help support his placement there. And as well, keeping the line of communication open with the grandmother, who always knew what was being done at daycare. We knew what her particular concerns were, and she was in the end satisfied with the service. She was very pleased, and that child, when he became of age, we were able to keep in service and then transition into our organization has a Kids Ability School program, and he could move from the daycare into a supported school program to continue meeting his needs which we wouldn't have been able to do if they had been lost to service somewhere along the way. All right. So maybe we'll try and get one more question in um, before. And that, that means which one more question means we won't be able to get to everyone's questions. Um, but we do have uh, e email contact information and links to the sites of our presenters on, on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So, so and Michelle did say at the top of her presentation, she welcomes people to uh, contact her following this. So, uh, so we can certainly encourage you to do that. But the last question that I'm going to ask is, this one starts out with, it may not sound particularly family friendly. So I thought this needed to be asked since it started out that way. But she, uh, Angela goes on to say that they have just started to use an official cancellation policy that lets the families know that after a certain number of cancellations or no-shows, whether or not the, invention would con the intervention would continue uh, would be, was to be reviewed. The hope was to have parents better recognize their intervention hours are valuable and limited, particularly on a block schedule, and hope that families can value their sessions more. And she, she says, goes on to say it'll be interesting to see if they get overall better engagement with this approach or not. Do either of you have any experience with that kind of, I mean, a little bit more, I guess we call it a heavy-handed approach? Uh, Kids Ability, we have a similar sounding policy whereby if children and families miss two appointments without prior notice, they're discharged from service. And we try to tell them that up front so that there's no surprises down the road. And it is it does sound heavy-handed, and it, it was done for the same reasons that are described by the person asking the question. I don't know necessarily what, what impact it has on attendance rates or engagement rates, and it's been difficult to marry the match care path with the policy around discharge. Um, we try to still keep to the policy around if you've missed two, but what we've tried really hard to do with our clinicians and with our families is to catch families before they miss, before they start missing. And I think it has worked well in that way where clinicians are much more aware up front of, oh, they may have difficulty ending these or attending these appointments. Let's um, work proactively to solve some of the barriers to engagement or, or access beforehand. And so 
what we hope to do is to keep families from being discharged, but if, if that needs to happen, we can't continuously use resource. Um, families are aware of, of what the outcome might be using a policy such as that one. I'll just add um, that when, when the question was asked, and I'll just point this out as sort of a, a critique back, the assumption is that um, there is a need to educate the parents who are calling in uh, with, or failing to call in, that this is a valued, valuable service. And, and that right of way says that, uh, you know, they don't understand or they don't value you. And I think I would just say, is that the case? Is the cancellation, you know, oh, I, they don't care, it doesn't matter, or is it um, that other things are at play? And I agree with Michelle. It's, you'd want to, you want to get to the point uh, or do something beforehand, before it gets to that level. Uh, this may not be, uh, maybe there's, there's a lower level of, you know, conversation that they'll engage in um, before it gets to canceling. But it's a, it's a value, be careful of those value judgments because it could be inappropriate. All right. And I think with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, and I think we'll just, we'll just uh, hand it over to you, Brenda, first, and then to Michelle, for any, any final closing comments you'd like to make. I think when we fail to engage, my best advice is to not see it. It's, it's like a, think like a marketer. It isn't about people not, you know, foolishly not valuing what you have to offer. It's a, a, a approach or an opportunity to examine and say, are we meeting the need the best way? Does our product need to change? Do we need to target differently? And it's a beginning of a process. And that's what I'll leave it with. You, Michelle, any closing comments? Absolutely, I would echo that. I think I would commend everybody who's on the line for, for being present and thinking about these issues and being willing to to try and address these issues um, for the clients and the families that they serve, but recognize that it's not an easy solve, but there's lots of room for improvement. So congratulations on taking that step forward. All right. Well, thank you to thank you to both of you. I mean, that was really a fantastic presentation. As I said at the beginning, it's it's not the the, the clinical focus or anything that people are dealing with on a day to day, but it's really something that impacts uh, the clinicians around the country on a daily on a daily basis. Um, so it was really a great discussion, and I do hope people can consider continuing that discussion following this, either following up with Brenda or Michelle, or you know, again, posting your comments or questions or uh, additional information that you might have around this on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, and uh, with that, we'll close off this webinar. So uh, thanks to the audience for coming. Uh, we are sort of uh, pretty much not going to be having too many webinars over the summer. There will be a few here and there. You, if you are signed up for the uh, email, the CAFC presents email notifications for new webinars, then uh, you will receive them and you'll, you'll, you'll receive the schedule as they're coming. But we will be slowing down a bit over the summer and, of course, certainly ramping up back in, in, in September for sure. We typically do these at 11 a.m. Eastern time on Wednesdays. So, you know, again, check the uh, CAFC website website, the CAFC.org website on the CAFC Presents section. There's a calendar there that will uh, let you know when you can prepare for, uh, for the next webinar uh, that, that is to come over the, over the summer. So thanks again for coming, and uh, we hope to see you uh, on our next one. Bye, everyone.